Okay, my goodness. Thank you very much for, for letting me go through that. I, this, I Okay, so look, I have been unprepared for a live stream before. You know, I get a little bit late. I am completely unprepared today because I was working on my diorama this morning. And I look up and it's like, oh my goodness, it's 11. I haven't even sent anything out. It's just crazy. Let me stop this banner here. But I mean, I've got some fun stuff. And, and, and what I want to do is I want to show you um, a video that I shot of the World War One trench diorama earlier today that kind of goes through it and we'll talk through it and stuff like that as I'm as I'm showing it. And um, I also uh, want to show some of the painting that I did this week. So one of the things that was really fun and and okay, let me back up. Remember where I started and said I'm unprepared. Well, I typically have those slides. I, I show you slides and pictures of stuff that I've done this week unprepared. They're not like ready. So I think part of the time I'm going to like be working, putting some slides together while I'm showing this video and talking about it. So I don't know if I'll have my feet over there doing stuff, typing or what, but uh, it'll work. I promise it'll work and it'll be fun. Um, so thank you very much for coming in. Happy Friday. And oh my goodness, what a, a week. I, I was able to, um, in essence, finish it. Now, I, I kind of feel weird about saying finishing the, the World War One Trench Diorama because, um, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to play this in the background with no sound, so there's just something to look at, like pictures. Okay, so just me before talking. The um, so I finished it this week, and what I found was I needed to do a bunch of little things. Um, I knew I had to do some painting on the figures that are left. Um, I needed to get some mud on them and I needed to get some mud on the figures that are down below the, the people in the trenches, or I'm sorry, in the saps, in the tunnels, all of that. So all of that needs to be taken care of this week. So I, I, I dove into it. And then I get this, this idea of, of uh, you know, they're not muddy enough just by putting mud on them, you have to paint it in. And you so anyway, that's what I did. I, I, I really went deep. I painted in all the mud on each of these figures. And frankly, I'm really happy with it. I think they came out great. And, and, and I do want to show you some pictures because the mud, and that's why it's called Muddy Knees, the, the episode, was really about, uh, I'm going to just go back to me real quick. The mud was really about, showing the emotion that these figures were in the state that they were in. And I thought it was a great counter to the pictures that, that I'll show. I got to get there that I'll show of these um, figures. When I painted them initially, they just kind of looked very indifferent. And, 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 and that's, you know, I, I, yeah, I wish I would have done this earlier. Uh, I, I know I needed to, but I'm going to show you something here. And what it is basically is um, if this will work, I think it will. Uh, we're going to go gallery. And I'm sorry, folks, this is just really horrible of me. But um, I just I did not prepare properly. Escape, you silly thing. What are you doing? Uh, I'm I'm trying to get some pictures so that I can show you of what I'm talking about because when I painted them, I, I initially thought I just need to get some grit on there and I need to get like some of the sanded grout that I use. And then I'll take that sanded grout that I put on these figures and I'll paint it up a little bit. And it, that was just the initial thought because I'd never done mud. I'd never, I mean, I'd done it on a vehicle and that's kind of how I did it, but I'd never done it on a figure. And this whole thing about the figures just looking like, you know, whatever, having no real uh, emotional look to them really struck me as I was painting them. They just like, looked like they were standing there, but as I painted them and as I weathered them, if you will, it really, it really started looking like they were miserable. And then I started feeling 
those feelings of, man, I'm wet, I'm cold, I'm muddy, I'm coming back. You know what I mean? So this is what I want to show you. And thank you very much, Scott. Um, Scott was, you know, we got your back. Take your time, Bill. Thank you so much. Because I think these pictures are really good. And, 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 and I think they'll help you a lot um, in, in trying to understand what the heck I'm trying to say. Um, but painting the knees, painting the mud on it, it looked wet. And, you know, I think if you've been hunting or if you've been out in the woods or if you've been hiking or possibly in the military like me, and you go out there and you're walking in wet conditions, mud possibly, your clothes get wet. And then you get a little cold. Then they get heavy. Then you get miserable. And that was the thing I was able to get out of these characters or these figures that I was just trying to put a little bit of mud on. And I thought it would need to look like they were muddy coming back from a patrol. But it was completely different when they were done. They were miserable. I added wounds. Um, I wanted it to look like these guys had really gone through it, you know. Um, I, I literally bloodied their knuckles, the backs of their hands. You know, they're going through wire. They go on a mission that began in the diorama that I first built in 2019. That's the other cool thing about this. And that didn't, that, that wasn't planned. It was just this, this happy thing that happened. And, and so, man, I don't know if I can even show that today, but I would, I would sure like to, but I, I don't think I can. Um, so, uh, and then Jacob says, hello, Bill, and everyone else. Glad I could catch this week's live stream. That's wonderful, Jacob. Thank you very much. And Jacob's been texting a lot during the week, uh, like, like many of you have. Well, so that's, that's really fun. So again, what I'm going to try to do, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to start this other video because there's narration on it. And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to try to work on some, uh, get some pictures for you. Uh, and, and, uh, I think it'll, it'll work. Uh, so, uh, give me a second. I'm going to do this and, uh, we'll see how this works. Okay. But, um, that is the, di okay. So before the live stream starts today, I just wanted to do this. I'm on my little gimbal deal and I am, I'm going to just show you the whole diorama. It's, it's pretty well done. And I wanted to go over it so that you had, you know, a real good look at it. Um, and then I'm going to kind of talk about it as well after we take a look. Started it July, I think around the first week, end of the first week of July last year. And so I'll count the weeks and all that eventually. But um, it has been a pretty all-encompassing build. Um, there are 37 and a half figures in it. That's a number I came up with because I have a half a guy in here. There's also a skeleton, like an upper torso of a skeleton in there. But um, I did not count him in the figure count. But um, that is the diorama. And um, let's see, where do we start? And that's what I'm also trying to figure out at this point. Where do I start in trying to explain this to people? My gimbal's just doing weird stuff. Um, how do I explain this to folks? How do I tell the story? Because there's so much going on, and it's, it's not like a linear story, like maybe one of my other dioramas. It's more of just a... A series, of event, a series of events all coordinated to hopefully happen at the same time. And um, it also, I think, is really fun because it connects to my other World War I diorama that I built five years ago uh, in 2019. And uh, it's my only other World War I trench diorama. So anyway, this is the diorama. Um... All right, how does it, how, what, what's the story? What's going on? Why don't we start over here? This is the laboratory of Captain William H. Livens. And he's a real person. He um, was born in the 1800s. I don't know when. 
but in 1916, he invented the Livens Large Gallery Flame Projector, and it was an underground flamethrower that um, was used uh, four times, possibly five. Uh, I think it was deployed five times and used four because the last, um, the last one, or one of them, the fourth one collapsed, the tunnel collapsed around it. The flamethrower um, would deliver diesel and kerosene. So this little scene in here is meant to be his personal laboratory where he's designing the entire thing, but also primarily the fuel that it'll burn. And my idea in making this was that, you know, the fuel, he didn't know exactly what fuel to use. Uh, I mean, maybe he had an idea, but he, he maybe wanted to experiment, you know, what kinds of fuels were the best for the application. So this lab has got, well, supposed to be, that's all scratch built, um, like distillation equipment and fuels. And so it smells like a fuels and stuff like that. And, you know, this guy, Boris, he's, uh, he's about to light something. So who knows what, yeah, anyway, it's very scary, very tense, but hopefully interesting as well. Um, sorry, I'm trying to zoom out. So that's, that's kind of where everything starts. Now his idea to build this machine is coming to light over here. So we're going to go down this vertical uh, trench shaft to get all the way to the bottom. And down here, when you get to the bottom, those red lights in the back, they're, they're supposed to, you know, signify, you know, danger, blah, blah, blah. And what we have here is this guy, he's just on a pump. You know, there was water in, in these trenches and, 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 and tunnels and saps. And so they needed to pump that stuff out. So it's a manual pump. This guy is, is tending um, the fuel cell. Basically, it's a, uh, a series of three tanks on top. The, the original had five. It was 56 feet long, so I, I have shortened it, of course. But on top, those are fuel tanks full of diesel and kerosene. And then below, there's like this, this uh, long, bolted-together ram. It was like a piston that would pressurize and then force that fuel up to this this nozzle or this head so here we come around and, and what i've done is and this is of course all fantasy but my idea was you know i wanted kind of a james bond you know q kind of laboratory where they invent all this kind of stuff and that right there in the center this is hard to hold here um is the the large gallery flame projector so what would happen is that would pressurize it would push this head up through the turf you know it was buried near the the german lines it would push it up through the turf and then it would ignite and then spray all this fuel into the german lines and so this is where this is being built and tested you know this stuff they couldn't go down to the hardware store, so I've just got a whole bunch of equipment and stuff in here that they're basically trying to cobble this thing together, you know, and build it from Captain Livin's designs. There's an officer in the back. He's in charge of this area, and then two workers. Uh, this guy's defusing a bomb to see if there's anything he can, you know, pull out of that, and, and that is a nod to my nephew because he is a uh, uh, an EOD diver in the Navy, so... Um, that's you, Will. Um, so that is is what they're building down here. This whole facility is basically based on that weapon and deploying that weapon in um, you know in the in the in the French lines. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. I uh, that little video I shot this morning. Um, because that was something that I wanted to show it's, it's, it's all together. And I wanted to show on the base and, and everything like that. I'm going to go back to that. And I want to talk about some of those things. And, and, and certainly I'd love to answer your questions because effectively it's done. Um, what I'm doing in, in, in some of the pictures I'm going to show next, they are pictures of just those final things getting the 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 figures mounted painting those figures like i was talking about the half person that that, that i did uh and, and we'll go back to the video so it's a little bit easier to see um 
but thank you so much for being patient. It's just been kind of a crazy morning. I, I, you know, I have no excuses, but let's take a look at some of these pictures now. So what I have here are um, just some of the shots from this week. And, and uh, it's, it's, I should come back to this. It's, I'm trying to get ready for this next weekend. So that's one of the things that's driving this is, is me rushing through. Um, and so uh, it's 37 and a half figures. And, and we're going to get to the reason why here very quickly. But here's what I wanted to show you before. Um, this is the figure that I was talking about previously. I think it's a great figure. I, I had a great time painting him. Um, but to me... He looks a little bit plain. He's just, there's no emotion. There's no nothing. He is just walking. Um, these guys, they actually have a little of emotion. You know, this is the French uh, soldier. He's the driver. This is a, a British mechanic. Uh, they're out there and they're smoking cigarettes. Uh, it's maybe a little bit better picture of the cigarettes. Um, and I'm really happy with the size and the scale of the cigarettes that I used in this. Uh, I've tried to do that in the past and, and haven't got that quite right. These, I think, are are pretty much right on. Um, but it's also the difference between these guys, pretty clean rear echelon guys, and these guys coming back from patrol. I'm like, well, he just like he's got this real whatever look on his face. Well, this is what I went into. So I started and you'll notice on the bottom of his legs there and, and kind of coming up his jacket, there's just like mud caked on there. And that's what I wanted to do for the grit. So what do I use for my mud? It's the same stuff I always use. This is sanded grout. And the sanded grout is the same kind of grout you use for tile. But what I did with this this time was, see how well prepared I am. Um, what I did was I wanted to kind of sift it or, or get just the finest because I didn't want big clumps, you know, there's sand in here. I didn't want a big hunk of sand sticking to them. So I just took, this is my little setup. It's just a little strainer. It's a T strainer. Um, all kinds of strainers are really, really helpful in the, in the model building bench. And then I strained all of it out. And then I took that, put it in a little um, silicone cup, and then put some Mod Podge with it. And then I painted it on their feet. And that's what you're looking at here. So if you look at their feet, that's just sanded grout. And it's just the powder from the sanded grout. I could have used like um, dry pigments. But I think the sanded grout gave me a lot more, uh, just, I don't know, uh, depth, you know, physical something sticking to it. So then I just need to start painting it. Okay. Um so after I got that on there, the next thing was to use um, primarily two paints. So now I like these two paints that, I mean, I use these for all of the mud on all of these in varying amounts. And um, I use Vallejo RLM 61, which is basically German black brown. Now it, it, there's a C period black brown. So I don't know what the C is. Uh, combat? Chocolate? I don't know. And I say chocolate because that's the other uh, color I use. Vallejo um, chocolate brown. So, <clears throat> pardon me. These are the two uh, paints that I use for like all the mud on these. And the process couldn't be simpler as long as you're going light. You know, we've had a lot of folks on here that are that are much better painters than I am. Said that, you know, by going in very lightly, um, Thin it out, put it on, and then let it dry. That's how I did it. And then I go back in and highlight it. So, so what I'm saying here is I have these two colors, and this is going over um, a uh, khaki color. So it's not too far off. I think I can use these on other colors. So when I go in first, I say I do that very light uh, color. What I'm talking about is the lighter color you see above the dark patch here on their knees. Let's go to another picture here. It's a little easier to see. 
right there where the pointer is, that's the really dark color. But I want to start with the lighter color underneath. I'm starting with the lighter color, and then I'm building the darker color on top of it. And the other thing that's really important is, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I've been painting with acrylics for a number of years, but but this finite detail and this blending and stuff is is honestly pretty darn new to me. You know, I would blotch stuff on. Now I'm trying to blend it in. So I'm starting with the lighter chocolate brown, and I'm putting that on the background of the knee, and I'm kind of extending that up the thigh and then down below to the shin and then around the knee. And where I'm getting this point of reference is think about being out in the woods, thinking about if, if you haven't done that, maybe just working in your yard. You know, if you haven't done that hiking and stuff like that, think about being in your yard and just getting down. Where are all the points where you're going to uh, make contact with the ground? And that's what I thought of in painting my figures. So I went with the knees and I, I used the chocolate brown, the lighter of the two, and put behind there. Then I would start working other parts that I thought might touch the ground if you're crawling around on the ground. Um, places that would get dirty, places where you would get sweaty, and that's when I used the chocolate brown. So I did this chocolate brown all over it, and then I went back with uh, the other, uh, this is a better color here. There you go. Then I went back with that other darker brown, the German black brown, and went basically right in the center of those areas. Here's another picture. Hopefully that's going to show, because that's the other thing. The sleeves. When you're out in the mud, you're crawling around, think about what these guys are doing. They're going on a mission. It's in World War I, going under wire going through mud, just climbing up out of the trench to get to it, you're going to get pretty dirty. That's what I try to concentrate on. So I try to concentrate on elbows. I try to concentrate on sleeves. I try to concentrate on knees and the back of the knees. The back of the knees because I think you just get hot and sweaty, right? Um, and then the buttock. I have like at the bottom of their uh, uh, jacket that they wear, I would muddy that up pretty good. Same thing with that chocolate brown first, the lighter color brown. And, and let put that on, let that dry. And that, that, that drying allowed me to layer it. Because when you're doing these acrylics, and that was that thing I was talking about. I'm skipping all over, sorry. When I'm talking about how I'm layering it on these, uh, what I'm trying to avoid, or, or exactly what I have here is, uh, if you see right there in the center, I can't really zoom in, but it's called a tide line. And it's the edge of the paint where it just abruptly stops. And I, and I didn't want that. If you look down here on the knee, and I don't know if the next picture is a little bit better, maybe. If you look down here on the knee, I tried to work that, that brown up away from the knee, the lighter brown. And then once that was established, more of a shade, then I came back with the darker black brown. And, and that's how I, I was able to get this. Sorry, I'm going, my throat's going dry. The other thing was look at the sleeve. <laughs> I thought about, excuse me, when I would come back from the field, you know, we've been out here working and, and, and stuff. Uh, and Eric says camouflage black brown. Sorry. Um, I should have been looking at the at the um, comments, but Eric says camouflage black brown. Thanks very much, Eric. I appreciate that. Um, so that's what the, the the color is. So anyway, when I'm doing this, I'm working my way up slowly. But then you see here on the sleeve, that was a biggie. Um, getting that sleeve to look like it was in the mud too. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, next shot. Uh, here's some more. I, I tried to show that they were beat up. I tried to show a little blood. I didn't want gore. Okay. That's, that's really important. I, I, I've done gory stuff before and it was inappropriate. I did it on Wolfenstein and I showed some friends and, and, and stuff like that. It's on my Patreon site and stuff like that. And it's this guy, you know, getting operating on and it's one of those things, and I've talked about it before, where you get in there, 
you know, and if you're not careful, you can take it too far. And I did. I, I just did. So these, I just said, you know what? These guys have been on a mission through wire. You're going to get cuts. You're going to get scrapes. If for any reason they maybe got in contact with some German soldiers out there, they might have got into a fight. So I put little like red and uh, dark brown, because when blood dries, it goes dark brown, red and dark brown on their knuckles. Like they got into a fight, you know? Um, some guys got some chin marks, some guys got, you know, cheeks and stuff like they've been fighting or at least they've just been really through it. I really wanted these guys to look like there's a reason where they look, why they look kind of almost zombie like. And that was, I'm, I'm trying to combat that because remember when I said the figures, they just kind of looked, nah, they, they there, there was no, there was no emotion in the figures whatsoever you get some figures sometimes they're yelling or they're they've got this great you know pose or something like that these guys did not have any of that but by adding all this stuff it started to kind of give a little bit of, of of a reality to their pose to why they look so kind of blah they look a little zombie like and it's because of this they, they just came back and they all made it back but it's almost like this feeling of, I can't believe we're back. You know, they're all a little bit of low-level shock. So anyway, that's what I was looking for with these guys. And, and I think I was able to achieve it with, you know, the painting, the mud. That's what's so fun about this. Um, I, I got a, a, a question here. Um, and Eric says, uh, if you have any oils, you might be able to blend some of the tide marks. And I've seen you do that, uh, Eric and Rick and, and, and Rick Lawler and stuff like that. Um, and I tried it. Remember, I even tried it at your house one time when we were uh, on an AMPS meeting. Amp, uh, Eric is the president of AMPS in Seattle, which is awesome. Um, I almost I almost broke out that. I it just, I, when I get into oils, I really like them, but it's that time thing that just blows me away. And I know, you know, we, we've talked about all that, but yeah, it just really is rough for me. I can move on from one color to the next. And it, this is my issue. It's not oil's issue. But I can move on from one color to the next in acrylic so fast. I really like that. And and frankly, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it's coming out. But no, I, I get it. And, and um, I, I think that when I start thinking first before I do, I probably will do oils. And, and, and let me justify that statement. Um, one of the things that, that I did on painting these is I mounted like this one guy in the, in the diorama before I, I weathered him. Um, it's this guy. So this guy, see, he's all messed up. I got an eye patch on him, you know, and, and he's got a cigarette and, and he's coming out, you know, of the, the trench after seeing the medics that's that's part of the story that's that's part of that video i'm going to go back to in a little bit um they're coming back and they're basically filtering through the trench and as they do so they they stop by that medic station there this guy had an eye injury so he was first of course they get him patched up they move him along then the other guys are filtering through the the aid station there well it's that look on this guy's face. It's that look of complete, you know, I can't believe we made it out of that, you know? And, and that was the only way, again, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably just beating this into the ground, but I thought that was a fun thing from these figures that, that I couldn't get any discernible emotion out of from just building them. And, and so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really so happy uh, with how they came out and, uh, and how the mud allowed that to happen and a little bit of the blood and, and stuff like that. I didn't want to get gory, as I said, but there's enough uh, blood on there to show that these guys have really been through it. I got the mud all up, up on the jackets, up on their bags. You know, you set your bag down as you're going through it. This guy's got a cut cheek and, and, and his leg uh, is jacked up. Um, I wanted one of his hands, the, the, the left hand over the left leg that has, has gotten jacked up. I wanted that to have some, some blood and stuff on it. This is the last, you know, one of the last guys in the patrol coming in. 
Um, and then this is the, the half guy. I'm going to talk about that next. So yeah, I was super happy with how to do that, how to get an emotion out of those guys just by adding mud and maybe a little bandages and, and, and things like that. And, and I think really enhanced the story for me. This is a very different diorama uh, than ones I've done before. I had all got on and I talked about this last time, you know, going on to the story thing. And, you know, I've got this really involved story for the last couple of dioramas that I've done. And it's all, you know, in this kind of a linear thing. And like I said in the video uh, a little bit ago, I am a little bit taken aback because while everything is moving toward the same goal in this, there's so many different things going on here that putting a singular storyline to it is going to be a little bit difficult. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to figure out is how to present it. I've got a week to do that. I've got a week to figure out how do I properly present this thing so that people just walking up to it can see it without, you know, any pre whatever they've never seen a video or nothing. They just walk in and they see this diorama. How do I, how do I convey all of the ideas in it and, and, and all what's happening? So that is what I'm trying to figure out now, how to properly portray the story that I've built up in here, because it isn't linear like Wolfenstein. Uh, two dioramas ago, Wolfenstein was very linear. It was easy to kind of walk your way through it. And so I built little placards to show that on the outside of the diorama. It came out fun. And, and it was at the same show last year that I entered it and, uh, and, and I did pretty good. So, you know, I, I want to try to, get something that people will enjoy looking at, not just seeing it visually, but understand that there's this very deep uh, and um, involved story about what's going on here. And it is all interconnected. It's not one of those, I mean, I guess it is, but it's not a snapshot of just here's life. No, I, I, I want you to understand what's happening in here. Um, what What's going on inside there? And um, and try to engage folks so that they want to look even deeper because of the storyline. So yeah, that's that's my job. Now, uh, that's okay, fine, whatever. You're telling us this, but why? Well, the reason I'm telling you that is I've got one week to go and I have not worked on my Emma Carlos and Ichiro diorama. So I don't believe I'm going to be taking Emma Carlos and Ichiro to the show and which saddens me because I love that diorama, but to give it, even to take it, I want to be able to give it what it's due to, to present it properly. And I haven't done that. Um, it's been at a show, but it was, it was a display only show. It was the February show, but to put it in competition, it's just simply not ready. And, uh, like I said, it makes me sad, but the only diorama that, that I'm going to be able to take to the show next week is, is going to be the World War I Trench, which is fine. I, you know, I think it's great. I, I, I really like the diorama, so no problem there. But I, I, I did want to have that other one. So that's what I'm going to be doing, trying to figure out that story, trying to figure out how to relay all these concepts, all these ideas in, in, in a very easy to consume way so that people do get some of those answers. It's all fun talking about it, but when it's just sitting there, um, I want I want folks to know about the Livens Large Gallery Flame Projector. I want them to know that these are Anzacs. And I've given those visual clues and stuff, but I think that um, if you're not familiar with this time in the war or the players or or what this is about, then it could cause a lot of confusion. And 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 so I want to alleviate that. So that's that's coming up. That's this week. Um, Okay, so I'm going to go back and I want to talk about our little half guy because that's that's what this is over here. I I found this guy last week. Um I forgot I had this this figure and I I looked at him and he was just such a I don't know mopey was the was the, the, the word that came to mind. He was just in such a kind of a mopey stance. I said, well, this guy's got to be a stretcher barrier, a bearer. Um, it just looked like he's going to be carrying a litter. 
And so I went into that. Now I didn't have another figure. And so that's why I did this idea of a half of a stretcher. Now, like a whatever, I don't want to say, I didn't film making the little stretcher bars because it was kind of cool. And I've made them before. I, there's a stretcher inside the diorama um, by the by the medic station. But when I was making it, it's it's just brass bar. And, and I put it in my drill and stuff like that and make this really nice handle on the end. Well, I couldn't do that with this figure. And it was a really, I thought, a nice way of handling it the way I did it. I, I basically just drilled into the fist, just a single hole. And then I made a, um, I, I just, you know, took the end down um, on the lathe so it would fit in the hole. So I didn't carve one of them. One I did carve because it's very visible. Carve, lathe, whatever, turn. Um, it is visible, but the other one's not. So I thought that was kind of clever. It's just one of those details. But that's what he's doing. So the right hand, you can see the full handle of it. The left, you cannot. Um, the legs. The legs were dissimilar legs, but I needed to get something that was going to go ahead and look, uh, um, you know, like somebody in a, in a litter. And so I put those together and uh, shape them a little bit. And the white material in there is uh, baking soda and CA. So what I had was I had two very dissimilar parts to going, going together with a very small tenuous area that would glue. And because I needed some more glue area, I used uh, baking soda and CA glue as a filler. And um, I've shown that before. Um, it's a great way to do it. I will be putting together a video on that because um, it's a great way to, to uh, put some structure to your CA glue so it's a hard mass instead of just glue. The, the baking soda works like that. And it just instantaneously um, uh, solidifies and uh, works fantastic. I use it all the time. Okay. Um, um, and, um. So that's what I have here. I carved it down just a little bit. And then I figured out where our litter would cross that plane, uh, you know, the cutoff plane, modified it a little bit, and then put the figure on there. Um, and then when I mounted old Snuffy here, uh, he just, you know, went right in there and, and it works good. Um, I gave him, you know, an injured leg. He's not dead. I didn't want him bringing back a corpse. I just wanted somebody with an injured leg, um, wrapped the leg, painted him up. And, um, I think it looks good. I did not want to put any gore there. I, I said that earlier. Um, I just want to be careful with that. I, I just don't want to overstep that. So I just did the, the black plane of reality there. And um, I think it looks good. Uh, and, it's, and it's kind of fun because it's all cantilevered and stuff like that. So those are uh, the pictures I got. And it's all in preparation for that, their show. Um, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm really excited about it. So what I'd love to do it now is I would like to go back to the video because I did shoot earlier today the whole thing that goes through the story and looks at different things that I just really couldn't get with the pictures. The moving, the video works better. And I want to go back to that and then just talk my way through it, not necessarily uh, through the narration. Uh, Sleezen's here. Hello, Sleezen. Nice to see you. Thanks very much for coming. Um, so I'm going to play this and I'm going to put it in a manner in which I am there too. And, uh, we're going to see what I have to say. So, so let's go ahead and look up. What else do they need? Uh, I'm going to come up here and go to this level. So now this level is, um, these are all Anzacs. So these are Australians and New Zealanders, and they were recruited specifically because they were miners. Um, back in Australia or New Zealand. And so when I started this, I thought it would be just some, you know, guys digging. Uh, and, and no, they employed real miners that knew what they were doing. They did also from UK. They did it from everywhere. But just the, I wanted to portray the Anzacs because um, I had seen a movie Beneath Hill 60 and, and, and I really was intrigued by that. So in my story, and, and they did serve in France. 
But in my story, that's who we have here. So these are all the Anzacs, and they are they're digging. They're doing the the mining operation that that uh, they understand and 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 they know. Those are clay kickers. And um, you know, I just started watching Peaky Blinders. I didn't. Okay, so um, that I just wanted to stop and talk about this a little bit because. Uh, uh, oops, I need to not do that. I need to do this. Uh, and then this. No, what in Lord's name? I'm so sorry. So I wanted to talk about that and, and I actually did want to show it. So this is one of the next areas that I have to work on. The, this muddying up of the entire diorama means I have to get some mud down here below too. I'm going to use the same mud because I use that mud on their faces as well. And when I'm doing their faces and, and just like I'm going to do their legs and their arms here, I was really worried about losing the detail that I'd, I'd spent so much time trying to, you know, get in the painting, the uniforms, the painting, the faces the you know, and so is, is it, you know, did I go overboard initially now that I'm just going to muddy it up? And I don't think so, because I, I found that when I was doing uh, one guy in particular, and I'm going to I'm going to try to go back to him because I think it, it shows it pretty good. But it's our guy coming out of the um, coming out of the uh, um, tunnel that has the eye patch. When I was doing his face and putting mud on his face, I'm thinking, where's the blood going to be from the eye? Where's other injuries going to be? And where's the mud going to be? And, I, and I'm thinking, well, what they're going to do is they're going to wipe it away. So I, I, I was like, yeah, okay. I can, I can use that too to show that he's been through the medic and stuff like that. So if I can figure out how to show, there we go. So if you look real close, his eye has been cleaned. And it, it just says to me, he went through the medics. You know what I mean? He did go and see the medics because that's what they would do. He was dirty and filthy. He had an eye injury. So he goes and sees the medics. And then the medics are going to go ahead and clean his eye. They're going to check the other eye. It's those little things that make it really fun to add these kind of details. I'm making all this stuff up as I'm doing it, sure, but I'm making it up with the idea that I'm trying to add depth to the story, and if somebody else notices it or asks about it, there's a reason for it. Why is the whole face dirty but not the eye? What's with the eye patch? I've got that story about it, and, and I think that makes it I don't know, funner to do or maybe more interesting for the person that's looking at it after you've done it. Because if you had that in, in mind, even if you're not consciously trying to put it forward, I think you do put that forward. You do put that idea behind what you're painting into the painting uh, and somebody will pick it up. I mean, they got to look really close. But yeah, it's in there. And, and, and I try to do that. And, and it's not like a natural thing. This is from watching uh, the special features on people that make movies. And I remember watching, um, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but he worked on both um, Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, and um, with Peter Jackson and uh, King Kong. And in the King Kong special features, he talks about that. And he talks about the ship in the remake of King Kong that Peter Jackson did. And he said, look, every, every bit of this ship needs to tell a story. Every little detail that we add needs to have a reason that it's there. And, th and that really struck me. So it's not like I just figured this out all on my own. I'm, I'm listening and I'm trying to pick up these ideas and, 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 and these um, techniques from folks that do this professionally. And that's why I love you know, the, the, the making of and, 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 and all of those things on DVDs or special features, uh, because they want to tell you this, they, they, they tell you why, and it's helping me to try to bring in, I believe more detail to my dioramas. I've heard people say that I, I'm really good at detail. Well, I think two factors go into that. I try to build a story and I try to be 
in that little area and think if I'm here, what would I be doing? That's, that's the number one thing. But I think number two and, and, and very, very important is the time that I take in building these dioramas. This has been nine months. You know, I, I say it all the time. It's taken me this long, blah, 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 whatever. Well, the reason is a lot of that time is looking at it. And a lot of that time is just trying to figure out what to do next. What would make this scene a little bit better or what what's missing or why is that that color? Asking those questions and then come up, up coming up with with you know answers to try to make it as realistic as I possibly can. If there's something missing, I, I, I want to put it in there. When I was doing, for example, when I was doing the little guy that is in the stretcher, the, the half person that's that, that's being brought into the trench, um, the body was a bit thick just because. And so I thinned the body down. Well, what it did was then it, it created this gap below what would be the lower back and the, the bottom of the stretcher. And I'm like, well, what would be there? I, I didn't want to re-carve it and do all this stuff because everything else was looking good. I just had this gap. So I just thought, well, when you're laying down at your clothes, <coughs> excuse me. So that's what I did. I stuffed in a bunch of, of uh, leftover um, um, Mod Podge and paper and stuff and made it look like clothes are bunched under the figure in the stretcher. It's that kind of stuff, you know, just by thinking it out, you get these ideas and I don't think maybe you, I mean, maybe you do, you, you're just really, really a lot faster thinker than I am, but I don't know that I would have those ideas if I were trying to get it done in like, let's say a month or <coughs> I'm, I'm rushing through a model or a diorama because I want to build the next one. You know, I, I have a bunch of friends that build and they're talking about the next one or the third one, you know, after this and whatever. And, and it seems to be a race to build as many as I can. And, 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 and I'm not there. That's, that's not my, my thing. I am trying to do every single thing that I do as best I can, number one. And I, and I know they are too. That, that's not the point. But I, I guess by taking the time, it's allowing me to do more to the model because I just get ideas over time more than if I weren't spending that amount of time on it. I'm living with these things for months on end. It's here. It's in my conscious thought. Um, <coughs> excuse me. My, my throat is just dry. Um, so I'm always, you know, ruminating over what's the next thing. What do I do next? Um, so that's important, you know, uh, trying to uh, come up with ideas. Time, I think, has really helped me a lot. So let's go back to this and take a look. Oh, uh, and first last says, <coughs> leaving a clean space or placed apart, uh, being an eye or a fender is great. There's a reason why it was there and it creates questions as a placement use. Yeah, I, I, I really do believe that. When, when something is there, um, it, let's say like background or it's just on the ground, it's flotsam, whatever. If it's completely out of, of context, then, then it becomes a distraction. You know, it's got to have a reason why it's there. Now, I personally, and I've said this before, I think Martin Drayton is brilliant at this because his his P38, I, I think that's in the hand is, hands of JB at this point. I don't know who he gave that to somebody, which is amazing, but his P38 diorama on the beach, and it's got a couple of parrots on the tail. Um, I, I just love that because just the thought process of, you know, it's P38, but to have parrots on the tail, why would that be? Well, it's a crash P38 in the South Pacific. And, you know, that's what I mean. It completely in context, it's, it's a bit of a shouldn't be there, but is, and it, it's, it's all the more wonderful for it. So I, I just thought that was great. So yeah, uh, you know, having those details and stuff in there, um, it has to fit. Uh, hey, sorry, just got home from work. Thanks very much for coming in, Neil. I appreciate it. Um, 
So today we are just talking about almost the completely finished uh, diorama and what's going to come up next. So because next is is trying to come up with that story in um, a relatable fashion. Uh, and and I got a lot of ideas, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So we're going to go back and look at this here uh, video again and see what else we got going on that didn't know about Peaky Blinders and, and now I love it. But um, yeah, a lot of the thought went into this from um, Beneath Hill 60, but now also Peaky Blinders is is something that I really enjoy about it. So anyway, that's what we have here. Uh, they're doing the digging and, and this is going to be for the deployment of the weapon once it's done. So they're, they're you know, trying to get this tunnel prepared to, to deploy this thing. Again, it was 56 feet long. You know, this thing was massive. So they needed uh, to get that thing in and they had to start early even before the weapon was ready. Um, in reality, it wasn't done under the lines. I'm pretty darn sure, but that's, that's I wanted to do it here. It's just kind of fun. So now in in just general operations of, of, of my, uh, saps and sappers and stuff like that, they had listening posts. So down here past the guy that is pumping uh, you know, water out of there. And I can't really get a good picture of it here, but there's two guys at the end of a tunnel down there. It is lit. There's a couple of lights down there and stuff. And, um, they are a listening post. And because what they did was as they started doing these underground operations, they had to make sure that other people weren't coming toward them. So they had listening posts. They had like a geophone. So I've got two guys down there at the end of that uh, tunnel. They're listening. They've got a geophone and they're listening for Germans. Okay, so that's that's something maybe kind of fun to talk about. Um, the geophone was something that they actually invented, you know, one of those World War One things, and and it was nothing more than a speaker, an amp, and and um, a mic. But the mic they could take and put up against the wall, and then the speaker was like a headphone, and it would amplify it so that they could listen. So it was a two-person team. And I saw it in, in Beneath Hill 60, and then I read about it. And um, they actually invented that for that. Um, they could triangulate underground by having multiple listening posts and then, you know, counting. At the, it's just, I don't know how they did it, the triangulation and, the, and the figuring out how far or close or stuff like that. But they were able to work that out. Now, in the story and in the video, the Germans that are below in the diorama have been there the whole time. So that's something to kind of, you know, just kind of keep in mind. So let's take a look at this again. Uh, and then by the way, I had to put some Germans in here. Uh, here's some Germans and they're all well established. So they don't even have to dig anymore. They're just traipsing right through there. So I thought that would be kind of fun to, to have Germans, you know, already in there. Uh, so they just have to walk quiet. They're not even digging. So anyway, that I thought that was just kind of fun. Um, so going to the top up here, we have the trench and this vehicle is important because this is being driven by the two guys that are down here. This is in the Anzac common room and, uh, they're playing cards. They're best friends. They, they drive this vehicle. They bring supplies. They just do all kinds of stuff. Um, and, and also go on missions. But right now they're just playing some cards because it's a break because they're, you know, part of these guys and they don't get to visit with Anzacs very often. So they take a little bit of a break. Um, here we've got a British mechanic uh, and then a French mechanic driver uh, just hanging out and talking. And the French uh, uh, mechanic driver is there because uh, the French commander, the local garrison commander, is down talking, uh, having a heated argument with Captain Livens because he's kind of afraid that, um, you know, this this whole operation could be dangerous to the villages, uh, you know, close here. Um, and, it's, and it's many miles away, but because of all the, you know, crazy stuff he's doing, he's just trying to figure it out. So he's just talking to him. Uh, these two guys are, are relatively clean, uh, and, and, and I wanted to make that point because they're kind of rear echelon guys, uh, and they're just like smoking cigarettes. Well, this guy is coming back from a mission, and he's got his you-know-what kicked. Um, 
They are coming back from a really, really difficult uh, mission. Uh, I still need to put a, a strap on his, uh, a shoulder strap on his rifle. But um, yeah, so they're really beat up. And I really wanted to show that contrast, you know, the muddiness and, and what they go through and, and even the injuries, you know, it, their knuckles are bloodied. You know, I, I really wanted to take that to that point um, because they've been on a mission. So those guys are the ones that are kind of filtering back in off of a mission and they're kind of coming in and there's also a medic station uh, uh, in this particular area. That's why they're coming here. And so as these guys are, are filtering in with their injuries and all that, they're coming down to this, um, this medic station and this guy um, is uh, checking in and because he uh, got shot in the leg and so his leg is injured and so this okay so <clears throat> clearly i should take some lessons in speaking um the the whole thing about the medic station was i i hadn't planned on a medic station i didn't really have an idea for that medic station to be anything other than in a lot of the pictures that i saw prior to, to carving that out, I saw a lot of dugouts, you know, people, uh, soldiers would dig out into the sides of the trenches and they were sleeping and they were just, you know, trying to catch a break and, 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 you know, whatever in there. Well, um, that was the original idea. <clears throat> Pardon me. When the whole vehicle came along, when that opening to the trenches, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm sorry from across that area that I had created came up, I thought, well, wait a minute, this is a great place to have that medic station. And then I went all that whole jag about putting the medic station in. I guess the reason I mention that is it's become a really integral part of the diorama and it was never planned. And I, I seem to do this a lot. Um, Ghost is saying hello. I don't know if anybody heard that. Um, that's something that I tend to do a fair amount of. When I get into my dioramas, there seems to be like one, sometimes more, but 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 definitely a thing that I focus on that that becomes really an integral part of the diorama that was completely out of my sphere of thought when I first imagined the diorama. And <clears throat> excuse me, I thought it was because I was a poor planner and, and it was unique to me. And, and I've come to find out it's not at all. It's just something that a lot of creators do. You know, you you get inspired by something that you've already created. But the reason I mention it further is the fact that I leave myself space now for that to happen. I give myself a chance to expand the story and I don't worry going into it so much about, oh, I haven't figured that out, or I don't know what I'm going to do with that area, or, you know, I've got a lot of something over here, but there's nothing to counterbalance it. I, I think that by leaving that space, both in my mind about the story and physically in the diorama that I'm building, allows me to take advantage of those ideas when they pop up. And that's not the only idea that pops up. There's lots of ideas that pop up that just, you know, get chucked out. But um, when one does stick, like the medical area here, um, it's really nice to be able to have the ability to just dive into it by not having so stringent of a plan that's like, no, that's going to derail this. That is not for everyone. That's my way of working. Um, maybe yours as well. I know some people that fully plan their stuff out and they just, you know, they just knock it out. And that's wonderful. Um, I'm more of a let it kind of develop on its own. Let it, um, let the genesis of what it's eventually going to be happen from what you're doing. Um, Cause I, I, I like that. It's a surprise to me, number one. Um, and that makes it enjoyable. That makes it fun. I, I, I don't know what problems I'm going to solve today. Um, but that's one of the reasons to, to do a craft in my mind, uh, solving problems. And so sometimes I'll create the problem knowing I don't have the answer, but it doesn't stop me because I'm confident that I will solve it down the road. Okay. So, um, this is all in preparation, of course, for the show that's coming up. So I'm going to go back 
to show you the flyer because I really think it's a great show. I really think it is um, it is something that if you're in the Seattle area um, or even sort of close to the Seattle area, it's a really worthwhile show to go to. This is the first. It's not the first show I ever went to. The first show I ever went to was the Model Flight display only show. This is the second show that I ever went to. And um, the second time I went to it, um, I actually won an award. And, and that was really neat. Um, I've talked a lot about uh, shows and awards and, and, and things like that in, in the fact that it's not something that I'm, I'm so much into. It's, um, you know, I'm not, I don't know why I switched that thing like that. Sorry. Um, you know, I wasn't into this for winning awards and stuff, but, but I've, I've changed my mind and, 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 and not dramatically because I still don't build it to uh, win an award. I do think that by going and entering the competition, it's given me a perspective that I didn't have before. It has said that I do want to do it some more. Um, and I don't want to do it to, I do want to win, but I do want to do it for the experience and to see what it's like. Um, I think the best thing is not winning. If you can get that feedback. I'm going to also judge this year. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that too, to learn what the judging is like. I've, I've heard a lot of stuff about IPMS style judging and I've wanted to say some things because there's some, some very logical arguments for and against it uh, or variations needed, whatever the case may be. But I didn't feel because I had only competed once and I have never judged that I didn't really have a voice. I didn't have something that I could say about it, even though I believe in the fairness, you know, and, 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 you know, you, you, if I'm going to a com competition, what I'm hoping to do is learn from it. Honestly, um, winning is a wonderful thing. I, I'm not going to lie, but learning how a competition is run, um, what they look for, uh, not to necessarily change your, your method, but maybe to improve it. Um, I get so involved in the story. I don't necessarily clean. Well, I, I do now, but I didn't really would clean seams. I was just like, the story is what I'm after. And the, the figure is just whatever, or the model is just whatever. But now I like, you know, I've seen at a competition in other shows so nicely built and the care that somebody did on a vehicle or a figure that it's like, it's, it's almost a respect for the viewer to do it as best you can, you know, and I'm not trying to blow it up into anything else that it's not, but I'm saying that's a different perspective that I, I did get by enjoying something that I'm looking at. And then if you look at something where somebody hasn't maybe taken that care, it maybe it's the, the extent of their ability, certainly. Because I know some folks with, with, you know, a hard time building and they still build and, and dang it, that's awesome. But at the same time, if I don't give everything I can and do the best job I can, then I really shouldn't deserve any kind of praise or thanks, or you're just, you know, whatever that you receive from that. You know what I mean? It's a respectful thing. I, I, I think that me doing better is respectful for people that look at it. You don't want to look at it and you go, oh man, he didn't even clean. You know what I mean? That, that kind of thing I don't want to do. I want people to enjoy what I do um, as much as me. Because that's why I'm doing it is to enjoy it. And I think that other people create because they enjoy it firstly, but then comes that pride and, and why not show it off? So yeah, I have, I have totally come around on the competitions, but um, I really think it's, it's important to understand what the competition is from all angles. So I will go in and I will judge this year and I'm very much looking forward to it and we'll see what I think about it after the fact. 
Okay, and uh, Eric says, uh, your dharmas would be awesome at Amp Show. Uh, the judging also lends itself to feedback. You also get to look closely at each piece. And I think that's really important. That's the thing I like about the amps. It's, it's, it's not a comparison, right? It doesn't, you know, it's not, well, you're better than them, so you win. It's really, seems to me at least, it's about um, seeing where you on, where you are on that scale of getting better, and which is something I'm very concerned with. You know, I've made this statement before. Every once in a while, I'll just ask Mrs. Mollocraft, is this getting better? Am I, you know, am I progressing? I think that's important for someone who enjoys something. Uh, I'm not, I'm not opposed to just having fun, I guess, but it's not fun unless there's some kind of challenge to it. You know what I mean? Um, I love playing video games. If I win it, on that level and i usually start at the bottom level i'm not a great video game player but i'll start on the very bottom level and i'll play that i don't want to play it again on that level but i do want to play it on the harder level you know what i mean so that to me means yeah i'm getting a little bit better each time and i'd love to get that feedback and i'd love to you know hear why i placed or or what or what i could do better to become a better modeler not necessarily to win next time so i just have this thing about competition i i literally i feel bad for the people that put all the same amount of work that i did in to what i did and or or see i this is the weird thing about this this competition thing you know i'm, I'm assuming i won right see when you're talking about it that's what i don't like about it too but what I was trying to, the point I was trying to make is the person that wins and the person that doesn't win, they put about the same amount of work and then they walk away going, why didn't I win? Well, that's the only problems that I have really with some of those judging systems that don't give that feedback. You know, if you see somebody's stuff and it's clearly better, okay, you can figure that out. But if you, and, and I've seen this a lot, and that's why it's so frustrating, I think, for people is they go, look. I'm looking at my model and I'm looking at that model and they're the same. I don't see any better. Why is that one better? Why did that one win? And I didn't even place. That's the questions that I've heard. I've, I've heard people very emotional about it. They, they, they put so much time in it. And so that was one of the reasons I didn't like comp competing. Right. I'm saying, well, I don't want to compete because of that. I just, I, I don't want to be in that point because I'm emotional just like everybody else. But at the same time, I, I, I do want to go through it. You know, I was very fortunate to have placed pretty darn nice last year. Well, I think it would be better to just flat out lose, you know what I mean? And then learn from that. You know, you got to have the whole experience. Anyway, I'm just rambling now and, and yeah. So anyway, Eric says, we can chat about it more tomorrow. Awesome. Yep. Uh, uh, you're judged against yourself. There you go. And I like being judged against myself. I like being judged by what I have done previously and improved upon this time. That's what I like. And that's an amps thing. That's their judging uh, amps. Um, uh, armor, uh, help me out here, Eric. Uh, armor, I'm going to say it wrong. Armor Modelers Preservation Society. There you go. So, uh, and I love amps. Yeah, we've got a meeting tomorrow. So we're going to meet up. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to bring this. We'll see. I brought this before, but, but we'll talk about it. So thank you, everybody. Gosh, I can't believe you have been here. Now I've got that whole video, um, that I've been kind of going back and forth to that. I'm probably just going to post because it's me, just this meandering talk through. I mean, we can go through it here. If you guys want to see it, it'd be fine. And I can answer any questions you got. But I don't want to be just like dragging this thing on, you know, um, if you're not interested in what it is. So you tell me, do you want to see that video? And we can kind of go through it again. It's just a meander through kind of looks at stuff. But you, you, you've seen the tone of it. It's just real, you know. Eh. So you tell me what you think. I got some questions. Uh, John says, anyone entering competition should understand that there is always a level of subjectivity to the judging and not see it as the... Uh, and I'll be all, and, and I think that's really important. Uh, that's a really good statement, John and hello. 
John, it's great to see you. Um, I have, I've, I've talked to enough people that have said, I entered in this show and I didn't place. And in this show I did. So yeah, you know, um, when you go there, it's about what's on the table at an IPMS show. And, and, and frankly, that's okay. If it, if there's any other reason for someone to place or something like that, then it's wrong. And I think those are some of the questions that, that I heard, you know, online last year. And so that made me a little nervous, but, um, my own reasons for competing were, I just never, I don't know, for some reason, it was just not something I was into. Um, my model building, my crafting, my building, whatever I built was always so personal because I did it for, you know, family, friends, myself here in the shop for 30 years when I worked and nobody even knew about it hardly. I mean, I would tell some people, you know, but it was not a big, big thing. Um, that was just kind of personal. So, you know, why would I go to a show if it's so personal? Well, yeah, now it's a little different. So it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I don't even know if I'm saying any words. Is that words or just grunts and clicks and whistles? Uh, great video, Bill. Thanks for sharing your work. Thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate it. And Eric says, Armor Modeling and Preservation Society. Yes, thank you very much. I just, uh, you know, give me an acronym and I'll mess it up. There you go. So thank you very much. Um, so anyway, peoples, uh, that's what I got. Uh, I will take that video. It's like a 14-minute video. So I'll post it after the live stream. And it, it'll stand on its own. It's, it's a goofy video, but it might be fun to watch. And it just kind of is me going over this thing, real mellow, real chill. And, um, you know, kind of talks about it and stuff. So I'll do that after this. But I hope you all have a great weekend. I am excited to see Eric tomorrow and, and other folks at AMP Seattle. Um, and then next week, oh, this is a biggie. So tonight, it is the third, uh, is this the third Friday? I believe it's the third Friday. So if it is the third Friday, we have all Patreons for uh, the group build tonight. And next weekend, <clears throat> sorry, next weekend is the IPMS Seattle Spring Show. And Friday is uh, set up and load in. And, and, and so I'm a volunteer. Starts at two. So I can't do the live stream to, uh, next week. And also, I won't be able to do the group build next week. So I'm very, very sorry about that, folks. Um, I will continue to post shorts and everything like that, you know, all this week and, and stuff like that, but I just, there won't be a live stream next week. Um, so I'm very sorry about that, but, uh, I, I hope it's okay. And, um, and I really appreciate you, everybody that comes in and watches these. It, it's amazing. Uh, the rewatches too. I get a lot of folks that do the rewatch and I really appreciate that. Um, so thank you very much everyone for being here. Um, I don't really have a close. I, I was so unprepared this time. There's a whole bunch of pictures of this painting. I'll post that stuff too, because I did have a great time. I just, I just ran out of time today. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Eric, I'll see you tomorrow. And um, I hope you guys get a chance to get out there and get on the model bench this weekend. Be a lot of fun. If not, it's awfully nice outside too. Um, it's going to be like 70 today. It's 71 right now outside. I might have to go outside and model. I just may have to. Um, and Paul says, I will miss this next week, but enjoy yourself. Thank you very much, Paul. I really, really appreciate it. Neil, have a good day. Thank you so much, Neil. It was great to hear from you, and, and, and I really appreciate you coming on. Eric, Scott, thanks very great video, Bill. Thanks for sharing your work. Thank you so much, Scott. John, uh, Neil, everybody, first, last, sleezing. Uh, thank you all so much for coming on, folks. Um, I, I really, really appreciate it. So have a great weekend, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.